All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. The, the people are still sort of um, uh, rolling in slowly, but um, you know, since we only have an hour and we have some really great panelists, um, I want to give us as much time as possible for the discussion. Um, so welcome everyone. Let me introduce myself and my co-moderator, and then I'll tell you a little bit about um, who's joining us on, on the panel today. I'm super excited about this panel because we've got representation of patients uh, and uh, patient engagement and experience professionals from pharma. Um, we also have representation both from the US and Europe. So we have a global perspective and hopefully a diverse perspective um, from both the patient and the industry point of view. I'm Hensley Evans. I'm a partner at ZS Associates. I'm based in Switzerland, although you can tell from my accent that I'm originally from the US. Um, and I lead our patient and consumer health work globally. I'm joined by Sharon Sukotliff, uh, who's also with ZS Associates. She's based in New York. She leads all of our patient centricity strategy and transformation work um, at the firm. And uh, she's too modest to mention it, but I'll tell you that um, she's working um, uh, night and day to uh, publish a book uh, that ZS is going to be um, putting out in January of next year on patient centricity um, and how to bring a more patient focused uh, business approach uh, to, uh, to healthcare. Um, we are joined today by um, some great panelists. So uh, first off, Desiree Priestley, um, who's the Senior Director of Patient Experience and Operations at Attica. Um, she's based in New Jersey and leads all aspects of patient experience um, and engagement activities uh, at Attica across the CNS portfolio. Uh, we're also joined by Jeff Rollison, uh, who works for Pfizer Oncology in the UK. He's the Director of Patient Experience and Service. Um, and he works with the NHS specifically across more than 30 of their sites to enhance and improve oncology patients' experience. Um, and I will say for our pharma colleagues that are joining us today, um, their, their legal departments request that we add that they're um, expressing their own personal views and um, not the views of um, their companies as a whole. We're also joined by two really amazing patient experts. Um, Birgit Bauer uh, is an MS patient expert and blogger based in Germany. Um, she's also a social media and digital expert. She consults to many organizations on how to leverage digital channels um, to better connect with patients and how to improve the patient healthcare professional dialogue. And then finally, uh, Monique Goramassi um, is based in New York. She's a global lupus advocate and uh, a national lupus ambassador. Uh, Monique is super passionate about diverse, inclusive, and equitable patient engagement approaches um, to really help drive better outcomes uh, for all patients um, across uh, many different therapeutic categories. So um, with that, I'll just say a few words about why we think it's so important to talk about uh, patient centricity with both patients and um, some of the experts um, here. So if we think about the patient journey, um, we know that there are enormous hurdles that face patients at all stages of, of their journey. Um, and you can see here, we've outlined just some statistics and, and facts about what kind of happens to patients at different stages of the journey from, from pre-diagnosis where we know a, a small minority of patients really feel comfortable navigating the healthcare system and figuring out who to talk to about their conditions or their concerns. Um, we know that in some rare diseases, it can actually take more than three years for patients to receive a definitive diagnosis. Um, we know that there's significant challenges for patients from a financial perspective, especially as they're bearing a higher percentage of overall cost of care. Um, and so financials um, really um, have a lot of impact on treatment decisions um, when really patients should be able to make the decision that's best for um, their their situation and, and outcome. Um, as I was saying, even once we get to treatment, um, the, we know that challenges continue. More than 20% of prescriptions that are written are never filled. More than half of people taking medications for a chronic condition drop off their medications within the first year. And most disturbingly of all, to me anyway, 
more than half patients say that their overall treatment objectives are not being met. Um, and so there's obviously um, a huge need to improve the situation. Um, and I think um, luckily, um, there is really a widespread recognition um, of this uh, of this need, and we're seeing more and more organizations um, turning towards uh, patient-led business models and patient centricity. And Sharon, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about some of the trends that are that are leading us in that direction. Right. Thank you, Hensley. Uh, Hensley, your camera's off. Don't know. Oh God. Yes. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. There um, you are. Okay. There I am. Been talking talking from afar. <laughs> Thanks, Hensley. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm Sharon Sakatliff, and as Hensley mentioned, I, I work in patient centricity at ZS. Just to build on some of the points that Hensley mentioned, right? We we all know that the patient experience is broken, that the patient journey is challenging and difficult, and uh, it's one of the reasons why all of us in industry have been focusing more on the patient to try and fix some of these issues. In addition, there are some other forces at play that are really pushing pharma to be more patient-centric. And we've got some of these here on the slide and I'll touch on some of them. The first is um, consumer behavior and expectations, right? We all live in this on-demand, always-on, personalized culture. And so there are expectations around our experiences in healthcare that are also moving in that direction. There's also growing competition for pharma in a variety of different treatment uh, categories as patients have more options. And so pharma has to think more deeply about experience as a, as a way to differentiate and improve outcomes. And I think one of the last ones I'll, I'll touch on is advancements in technology and data, uh, especially because this group has already, um, before the panel, spent quite a bit of time talking about data. You know, today we already have the ability to collect the data, to um, use advanced analytic capabilities and AI to know what patients might need before they even need it. It's one of those things that we just have to make it a priority. It's, it's hard, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. And I think one of the other things that really adds to that is things that are going on um, beyond pharma. Uh, for example, new regulations and guidance from EMA and FDA around patient-focused drug developments, some of the new interpretations of value by payers and providers, right, where the focus is really beyond clinical outcomes and also thinking about what patient's experience might be and what preferences are for the individuals that are going um, treatment. And I think this is where uh, understanding and connecting with people with patients in a deep and meaningful way, uh, early and often, as we say, is critically important. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna kick us off into the discussion. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so that uh, we can focus on, on the people that we've got here uh, to talk about. And I'm gonna kick us off by asking uh, the panelists to talk a little bit about what has changed in terms of patient engagement. And um, as you answer the question, please share a little bit more about your own experience and your background. And Monique, I'm gonna ask you to answer the first, the first question, please. Thank you, Sharon. Um, again, just really glad to be with everyone today. I am a, first and foremost, I always say I'm a patient. Um, I've, obviously, I'm a person. Um, I, there are so many other things that I'm comprised of, but before being an advocate, an ambassador, researcher, et cetera, et cetera, I'm a patient. And so the fact that we're asking this question and we're having this conversation, that is one of the things that has changed. Typically, I have found in the past that patients were not always being asked, how do you perceive this product to be in real time? Um, we were waiting until you know it was on the market. Um, and also we were not always engaging patient, patients from the beginning, from ideation to scale. And so that's just one example that I'm seeing. But the other example, which is a very big one that I'm sure we'll talk more about later is our perception of what diversity, equity and inclusion is, is bright, broadening we're really having to be a bit more reflective about our unconscious bias, our implicit bias, the microaggressions, and how we've widened the gap to actually include certain patients. We've thought that we've included all of our customers, but we've had a blind spot to who some of these customers are and where they live and the social determinants of health that affect them being participants. And so 
that is one huge piece that I really would like to make sure that we we keep in the forefront, right? As we talk about structures, we talk about incorporating new means of accessing data. Who's accessing data? Where are they accessing it? Um, is it equitable? And so these are things that we're really starting to have meaningful conversations about, but we're not doing it in our, in our own silos. We're making sure that these marginalized groups are also a part of the conversation and a part of the solutions. Oh, Monique, thank you so much. It's so important, and I agree. I think, um, I hesitate to say this, but one of the quote unquote, I guess, silver linings around the pandemic is that it's actually helped us shine a light on critical issues that were there before, but it's forced us to really pay attention and start doing things a little bit differently. And so with that, um, Desiree, I'm going to turn it to you. Maybe you can talk from the industry perspective around what are some of the changes that you're seeing within your own organization and how you're addressing engagement a little bit differently. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, good morning, everyone. Excited to be here and talk about this. Um, I love what you said, Monique, as far as from including patients from ideation to scale. That's so important. We talk a lot about co-creation and really making sure that we're not coming with half-baked plans forward to our patients, that we're actually bringing them in from the beginning and ideating together and formulating something that we can both kind of get behind and also taking the perspective of test and learn and then iterate. I think we understand that things aren't always going to be perfect when we launch them. And in general, I think that's very different for pharma. I think a couple of years ago, we felt like we had to launch perfect things into the market and then we'd find out that the end user didn't exactly like it. So I think it's been beneficial for everyone just to involve them earlier in the conversation and do that co-creation together. And then one other point that you made, Monique, um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, again, so important because we're we're all you know patients and caregivers at some point in our lives. And so understanding that we're just serving people and people are different across all different regions, across different states, across different countries. And so having that representation from all sort of parts of the U.S., at least in our business, um, is, is vital. And we're actually taking care to that local level. So understanding that issues in Pennsylvania might be very different than issues in California. And what do we need to do differently between those different areas? So those are things that we're really trying to tackle now. I certainly don't have all the answers, but what I can say is we're learning a tremendous amount from this sort of new approach to that local model and then also involving patients from the start. So I love where the industry is going and I'm looking forward to just continuing to learn more and bring more valuable solutions because of it. Uh, Desiree, that's fantastic and so wonderful to hear and um, completely agree that having that local perspective is, is crucial. Can you comment a little bit about what you guys are doing differently to get that regional local perspective? So we have, I can't divulge I guess too much, but we do have different teams that talk to patients across the US. And so taking those insights and putting them to action. So I think we're always looking at data, right? To understand trends and understand what is going on, but also taking in the insights to marry it with the data to actually ask more questions and seek mm -hmm. to understand. And that's when you can actually go to patients and say, this is something we're observing. Can you just, let us know a little bit more about what that actually is when you're seeing it happen in your local area. So I think it's just triangulating sort of everything together and having that deeper understanding. Um, and I think that's the best way forward. Hopefully Fantastic. that answers. Yeah. I think we might, we might all agree. Um, and Birgit, I, I'd like maybe for you to comment on that a little bit um, from the global EU perspective as to what, what you're seeing and experiencing, especially as we think about the local context and how that might differ. I think um, to talk about uh, to talk with patients or people living with chronic diseases, I don't see myself as a patient at every time. I have to be very honest. <laughs> uh, I'm a person living with MS, and I think uh, it's important to be asked and to be involved. But it's not happen at every time, and sometimes it happens too late. So sometimes things are already designed, they are developed already, and then they the people say, "Oh." maybe we should have involved the customer. Hmm. And then they start to, to ask the patients or the people living with the diseases and the end users. And then 
yeah, you should say something to a, a, a product which is uh, ready to, to be published or provided. And then changes are very hard to do because uh, people would have to go back to the development process and to change a development which is already done and finalized is, is a very hard challenge for the people. I can understand that. And therefore, it's it's one economic, but also a very important reason for the end users means patients to to be involved as early as possible to avoid yeah going back to the start like in the monopoly yeah go back yeah. to start don't take the money but do the things now and and this is this is something we have to respect and i think this is happening not every time so sometimes I, especially from startups, I hear that in the European area, oh, we have statistics. And I say, yes, yeah, statistics are great. So Desiree mentioned it very, very clearly. The statistic and numbers are really important. And I agree totally also as a digital health expert and social media expert. But you have to talk with the people, they should use your tool or your solution. If they don't like it, you can do whatever you want. They will not use it. And this is the point. And this is also investing money in a, in a wrong direction. So invest it in the people and let people help because patients know best what their needs are. Do they need more glamour in a solution? Okay. But uh, mostly they use, they want to have pragmatic, useful, feasible solutions. They can adapt from now to then in their day. And that's important, I would say. And this is something I, I want to see more. And this is also what I'm what I'm preaching since years now, saying, okay, come out of your silo. Let's have a conversation about it because it's so important. And you will have better solution and people will take it. Oh, if that's 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 the end of the thing. And I think that's important. Absolutely. Um, and so great. And I think uh, what we're starting to see to your point is that. Pharma is starting to move up a little bit earlier. I know Monique, you shared some examples in, in terms of um, different boards and panels that you're involved in to help industry with that. Uh, and I, I'm gonna ask Jeff maybe to comment on this a little bit, um, given uh, what your group does and how you work with, with patients. Yeah, thanks. And, and first of all, thanks to thanks for having me and hello to everybody from, from the UK. Um, yeah, so my team has has been working for several years now, developing collaborations with the NHS, and we've sought in every one of those to get as much patient input as possible. And that's moved from having fairly formulate questionnaires, which were handed out and recovered and entered into spreadsheets and so on, to a point of now being able to sit down and have face to face conversations with patients about what their experiences of receiving services in any given scenario. We use design thinking techniques, we use user-centered design thinking techniques to try to bring patients as much as possible into the design of new services or, uh, you know, kind of revise services for them within the NHS. Um, and we're finding that people in the NHS, our colleagues, our healthcare professional colleagues in the National Health Service are really really becoming really interested in doing it this way and whereas maybe six or seven years ago you quite often hear people saying I know what my patients want mm. and I, I know how my patients think there's a growing recognition that they don't necessarily know and that actually engaging with patients and using patients to co-create uh, as Monique said earlier to co-create and co-produce new services is the way forward within within the oncology business unit in Pfizer UK, we're developing uh, what we're calling the Cancer Insights Panel, which is a, a panel for a group of people with lived experience of cancer, again, to help us design the way future, uh, way forward in the future. And we're looking for this group to input to the strategy and the business direction for the BU. Um, and interestingly, we, in creating that panel, what we've done is recruited four expert patients externally to help us design the shape of the patient panel of the future and to help us go as far as designing the role profile for the panel manager and right. to help us design the adverts that are going into social media to try to recruit patients so for us it's a, a real commitment to to getting patients involved in everything that we do moving forward absolutely and i think it's a really big shift 
in uh, the industry and how industry views the work and the business. Um, one thing I've observed is that there are, um, pharma has worked with different patient councils over the years. I think the difference today is that now, instead of being very program focused or brand focused, these um, councils or, or panels are sitting above and really advising at a higher level, a more strategic level. And so um, how did we get here, right? This is a big shift. So Jeff, I'll, I'll turn back to you, but how, how did this change happen? Um, well, it hasn't been a revolution. It's been more of an evolution in my experience. And it's, it's something that's happened over a period of a period of time where, you know, interestingly, having a having a role entitled patient experience um, and not being able to actually talk to patients about their experience has begun to seem a little bit odd. <laughs> and so the conversation has been an ongoing one within within my organization about how we can rectify that and the validity of, of engaging patients within conversations about the services that they receive and clearly you know some of the old arguments that have gone on about being cautious about being too close to patients because of the fear of being seen to try and influence people and you know in in terms of what medications they might uh, receive have been i understand the caution but Again, to come back to my role and my team, we work above brand. We're non-promotional. We don't have any interest in, in the promotional side of things for Pfizer. We're not part of marketing. We sit separately and we, we, we focus just on patients. So it's, it's been an ongoing conversation. And I think, again, I think Monique might have touched on it earlier on in, in terms of it's slowly changing. There's a drip, drip, drip that people understand that we need to do more and more and get closer and closer to patients. And to Desiree's point earlier on, you know, we can't keep going to people with kind of half developed solutions to problems that we don't actually understand. What is far more logical is to go out, understand the problem first, and then try to come up with a co-created, co-designed, co-produced solution afterwards. Yeah. You know, if you don't mind me jumping in, because I'm kind of monitoring the Q&A, there's, there's a question from Natalie that, that really speaks directly to this about, you know, what, what piece of advice and, you know, I, Jeff and Desiree, but I, I'm also interested in hearing from Birgit and Monique, um, what one piece of advice do you have to convince a client who thinks they know everything about the patient journey um, to get patients involved early on in the development or design of a campaign or initiative? And, um, Jeff, your examples of the patient involvement in the in the patient um, panel is is really spectacular. I, I love that example, but um, I'd love to hear from others. How would you convince someone who know who thinks they know everything about the patient journey that um, it's valuable to involve actual patients um, in the in the development or design of the campaign or initiative? I can jump in. I, I, I would say that I, it's great that they have understanding of the patient journey. So that's good. But I would also validate that journey with patients just to make sure that you are truly understanding all the problems. And then I think it takes, I guess, a leap of faith to, to step forward and try to co-create a solution. It is a different way of thinking. It is newer for pharma. And I acknowledge it can be a little uncomfortable to get started. But my best piece of advice would be to just test it out. Try it once see what insights you get, because I will tell you the first time that we really deeply engaged with patients, we also thought that we knew what patients wanted when we were developing a certain solution. And I will tell you that it changed so much over the course of development with their insights embedded, and the adoption was so much more than we anticipated it would be pre if we had not been speaking to patients. So I don't know how to exactly convince it, but I think you just have to start and initiate that conversation and you'll see that your, your initiative is going to change over time and the insights that you get are so much different than what you perceive that you may know about the patient. I just want to jump in there. Um, Desiree, you said something so key, validating. Um, you know, I, I, it bridges also something that Brigitte say, and I, I will just want to challenge you were saying that if we have solutions for everyone that we'll, we'll take it. Um, we haven't built a trust 
uh, trust ethics and we haven't built trust with everyone. So the solutions for one will not be the solutions for another, especially when we think regionally. And so I think what we're doing is we're really saying, I don't want to treat my patients as a monolith. I don't want to treat Monique as a Black patient, as someone who might be experiencing lupus in Africa, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. I've learned that the experience is completely different. So when we talk about utilizing patient engagement, that's different in every aspect. It might be wearable tech. It might be uh, access to portals. Um, it might be telemedicine. But when we say we want collaboration with you, we say I'm trusting you in this process. We also say, I see you. And when we affirm the patient experience, the patient narrative, and what they bring to the table, it also reminds the industry of what is your why, right? Why are you creating this product? Why are you creating this program? Why are you in this service? Because patients want to know that there's a connection to why they're being involved, why they should take your product, why they should, you know, argue with their insurance company about getting a, a, an approval. Uh, because literally, I say, to, I say to the industry all the time, even though you don't know me, Monique, um, that I'm someone living with lupus, lupus nephritis, fibromyalgia, itis, 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 I know you. I know your products. You're with me every single day. And so have you gained the full length of my trust for that openness? I don't know. But when you involve patients, when you say we want to partner with you, and not just a conversation, but an actually production and output, you say I trust you in the process. And that's something I think we do need to work more on, that, that trust level and that transparency that patients are asking for. Absolutely. Um Birgit, this reminds me of a story that you shared uh, with me when we chatted um, last week around, uh, around building trust, where uh, I'll let you tell the story, but I'll remind you of which one it was, um, where you were working with a company and you were looking to help them achieve something and you were asking for a certain uh, approach and the answer you kept getting was no, but then something changed. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I told you a lot of stories, but what I wanted, <laughs> what I wanted to say is, trust is key. And uh, when you work with with uh, with companies, you you always have this. Oh, we we have enough numbers, and we 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 don't need that people on board. But at the end, they are using the tool, and this is this is the key thing. And uh, as I said before, it's it's very important that that we are the patients are involved because they have a voice and they share their information. They talk about a product. And if a product it's not good, they will share that information. Also, it's good, but we all know negative news are mostly more shared than the positive ones. And this is the one thing just to see from a communications perspective. And um, yeah, this with that client, this was, it, it needed a half a year or whatever to, to bring them to, together with the patients. And I said, always, oh, you have to talk with the people. They yeah. have to trust, they have to use your tool and they, they get, can give you the expertise and the re, they can report back. Is it feasible? Is it usable? Can I... Is it user friendly? And this is something you you can't miss, but you will not receive it from from the phrase we know our patients from statistics. This will not happen. This is the point, and and I I, th I think the key word is trust. So if if you trust in something in a product, you will use it. If you don't trust, you will not use it, and the product will stick into the into the corner, and nobody will will do something with that. Yeah. And I, I agree, by the way, I agree with all the things what have been said in before. You know, trust is coming up in a couple of the kind of Q&A and comments actually in the in the chat. Um, would love to hear uh, maybe, Jeff, your take on, you know, you're not part of the marketing function, but um, I'm sure there's some skepticism sometimes if you're coming from Pfizer. Like, what are you doing to sort of build um credibility and, and trust in, in the work that you're doing and have people believe that you're, you know, really a partner to them? So we looked at it really from a, a reputational perspective and from the, from, from where, I mean, obviously we're, we're a small part of Pfizer in, in the UK market only, but we looked at it from the perspective of how do people regard us externally and and we did some work 
probably 18 months ago, just before the pandemic, so two years in fact, um, to look at how to look at how external bodies regarded Pfizer oncology if my team had been involved in the work that they were doing. So if we if we delivered a collaboration project, how would we regard it as, as opposed to so we haven't delivered a collaboration project? So if you're thinking in terms of an ROI for the kind of work that we do and engaging patients in the work that we do, I think the ROI is that it changes people's perception of the organization itself. And it changes the perception away from simply being a transactional organization that hands over uh, as someone. As I think someone mentioned being just being a manufacturer earlier on. It changes the perception from just being a manufacturer who produces medication in exchange for remuneration, in this case, by the National Health Service, to a, an actual partner in the delivery of good quality healthcare services to patients that patients have been involved in the design and production of. So it, it kind of, it shifts us a little bit on the scale from where we were. And it, so in terms of overcoming the skepticism, yes, yeah, certainly it, it does exist because because it exists that's that's just the nature of uh, of the kind of industry we're in but you know i come from a background of working in healthcare services with the nhs and in other places where my focus has always been on improving things with and for patients i've brought that through i've been fortunate enough to be able to bring that through into my current role and we do see some change in people's perceptions of how the organization functions that's i'm not great. sure if i've answered the question or just no, rambled in, incoherently for a couple of minutes. <laughs> no, no, you, you absolutely did. And um, one of the things that occurs to me around trust, and um, this goes back to that story uh, Brigitte had shared, but my, my own personal experience where um, sometimes you don't realize how much we know and how opaque it is to others, right? And I think this is the big conversation we've been having around transparency. Um, I, it occurred to me, I, I spoke to um, a, a group, um, a foundation that was working in, in epilepsy and just sharing with them what patient centricity means. It was a group of parents of, of the kids with epilepsy, just what patient centricity is and what the industry is doing, which was, I think, um, eye-opening for many. And they didn't understand that this is something the industry cares about and is actually doing. And forget it goes to uh, the point you shared with me when we chatted, which was about um, the organization you were working with really explaining to you, this is how the process works. This is what we can do in terms of compliance. This is what we can't do. And that opened the door for trust and a new working relationship, right? It changed the way that you could collaborate because now everybody understands kind of what the quote unquote rules of the games are and, and where you have the opportunity uh, to really impact change. Um, and so uh, think, just thinking a little bit about impact, um, Jeff, because you brought up ROI. Um, so Desiree, I'm going to ask, you know, there's a lot of really interesting programs that your organization is piloting. And maybe you can share a little bit about how you think about impact. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I also saw in the chat, um, you know, how do you get some of these programs to move forward, given that we do we're in a highly regulated environment. And so just wanted to address sort of both of those probably at the same time. So when we talk about co-creation with patients, I think it's also important to include your legal and ethics and compliance colleagues as well in that conversation because it's twofold. They actually hear directly from the patients the problems that are ongoing, and then they understand better the problems that we're trying to solve. And they can actually come forward and be business partners and help us co-create those solutions so we do stay safe in a regulated environment. We don't want to inappropriate, inappropriately cross the line. And what Jeff was saying earlier, um, we're also a completely separate function. We do not report into marketing. So we're more above brand. Certainly we support patients that are on some of our branded medications, but we're really focused on patients. And so really coming forward with like a patient impact index and talking to the organization around the impact that we're having on patients is how we prove you know, that we are having that impact. It's not directly related to quote unquote brand ROI by any means. Um, it's much more above brand, but I think just communicating and having transparency about what's going on, why we're doing the different initiatives that we're doing, because ultimately we're directly hearing from patients that that's issues. And so we're trying to solve for those um, in meaningful ways. So that's how we're approaching it. That's great. Um, and Monique, I wonder if you want to comment on that from, from the patient, from the um, people receiving treatment side 
as to how you have felt things change, if you've seen things change? Sure. So, um, you know, one of one great example is my involvement with the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance. We're a committee of the American College of Rheumatology. And um, this is something that derived from necessity with what was going on with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Patients were on social media, and that's another great way that we're reaching out to patients directly. Patients were on social media crying for information that impacted their rheumatic diseases. Um, there was a lot of misinformation about Plaquenil and other rheumatic um, approved drugs. And so patients wanted to know how would that impact their livelihood? And what did it mean for them as someone living with an immune compromised disease? And I was asked along with seven other individuals globally to be a part of the patient board. Um, I'm now co-chair of the patient board and on the steering committee. But what we found in launching this were two great things. Um, patients want to be involved in research, right? We wanna be actively involved in research, but driving what's important to patients. And that's driving, whether it's peer reviews, lay summaries, the graphics, accessibility of the graphics, dissemination of them. Patients are really well adept in this area. And sometimes we go to the marketing or advertising companies, we think that they're the expert, but we don't include the patients in that very um, technical aspect of what, we, what the output is. And so that's one area where we really need to utilize the expertise of our patients. I say it all the time, your, pa your patients are purpose-filled. They would like to be utilized more than just sharing their story um, and being a talking head. And the other aspect was that we realized what we saw as a global approach was not always global. There were people who had very Western ideas of receiving and sending out data. and. I myself, I had to explain to them just because I am a black patient who has traveled internationally. I'm from the Caribbean. I've traveled to the continent of Africa. It does not mean that I can share the story universally of a black patient, right? And so I really stress the importance of when we need to speak to these individuals, we need to have them a part of the conversation and designing how is it that individuals in another continent want to have this information reviewed? How is it that they're going to to utilize this product. And so the Global Rheumatology Alliance, we see this as a really great template for not just bringing patients to the table, but bringing them as equal stakeholders. This is something that we haven't always felt that we've been um, equitably a part of, to be quite honest with you. And so I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. I saw a question about um, how do we engage patients in clinical trial design and recruitment and retention? That's that's so tricky. That's that's a whole other webinar, right? And I've spoken about this in, in nausea. But what I can say is that when we think about having patients a part of that process, it has to be at every step of the process. Patients who are involved in recruitment trial or clinical trial um, sharing, it also includes the aspect of informed consent, but health literacy. The health literacy of your population is so important and we cannot just put it on the patient. So we need to reprogram how the researchers um, think about what is the information that's being put out, not just putting the onus on the patient to be the end user, but how are you able to review this information if you were not a patient, right? And so we're asking that the onus not be put on the patient, but that there's a shared collaboration in that. Um, and secondly, when we think about the health literacy, that travels from start to finish. And so we really need to build up our investment in that for so many different levels of patients. Um, and that just goes back to what our diversity, equity, and inclusion stance is, not just the output, but the input. And that's the, 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 the final thing I'll say on that is, who is involved in that research, right? Who is our research team? Does it represent the community that we say we're involving? And so when we wanna partner with the patients, but they don't feel represented internally, then there's a huge problem, there's a gap. Absolutely. I mean, we hear that often is that if you want different communities to participate in your studies, then you should have somebody from the community talk to them about the studies, be part of the studies, be part of the investigation team. Um, and to that end, I see a lot of comments around health literacy in the chat. So maybe we can uh, probe a little bit about that. And uh, Birgit, I see you smiling. So maybe you want to comment around um, health literacy. And then I think we can jump to Desiree and Jeff as well. 
Yeah, so because this is one of my key themes at the moment, we need more health literacy, not just in the patient side, we need that for the whole citizens, for the whole population in the country. Because we cannot start to be to be more conscious about our health when we become sick. This is, is not the way we should start it. So health literacy mm -hmm. must be yeah, rolled out. I would say in school, it should be a course in school for kids to also to generate more health literacy. And I want to add digital health literacy because mm. we are coming more and more digital. Corona was such an accelerator for digital health, telemedicine, for uh, the electronic health records. So we are fighting for that in Germany, by the way. And we had some problems and struggles with that. Yes, but we are on our way now. And I think it's it's so many countries don't have that and we need to to build up that literacy level that health and digital literacy level in the countries also to the governments uh, by the way because sometimes i have my impression is that governments or politicians are not aware about that yeah. so in in a way that they can things move forward but to know how i use digital health to be to be conscious about it, to be aware about it, also for my health, for my health and my disease management can help us also to have a better healthcare at the end. But we have to build that literacy up. We need more education. So I'm working on a project. I'm sorry, I'm passionate for it. But uh, it's also about it for digital, for data saves lives, for example. It's one of those projects I'm involved in as a patient representative in a board because we say it's so important that people have the, the awareness and the knowledge. What comes up with my data? What can I do with my data? How are my data shared? And this is what we need also for digital health literacy and for health literacy. When you don't know something about it, you can't do things. And um, I think we are living in a very changing world and the system must, com must be combined. They must be connected. And if the systems, so patient communities, citizens, pharma, governmental, insurers, whatever, um, they must be connected together. But for this, we need that literacy that we can move forward and also change our healthcare systems because some systems are really lousy and they need to be, yeah, I would say they need a, a renovation. Yeah. They need to re be reorganized. Yeah. Uh, also to have better care available for patients, also therapy options. But for this, we need that literacy. I completely agree. And I think these issues have been around for a while. And one of the unfortunate consequences, one of the many unfortunate consequences of the pandemic has been that it, to some extent, became um, the consequences uh, around health for those with the haves and the have nots. If you knew how to use a smartphone, if you knew how to access telemedicine, you can get access to care. You can probably get access to your medications. But if you didn't, we saw, we saw the impact on people's health. Um, but before I digress, maybe Desiree, you want to comment a little bit about how uh, you guys are thinking about health literacy and some of the points that uh, Brigitte raised around data. Yeah, so I, I thought that Brigitte said it very well. Um, health literacy is absolutely one of our focuses, and especially around digital health literacy. I couldn't agree more that the pandemic really accelerated that adoption. That being said, I'll go back to the trust comment that I definitely saw in the chat. Um, I think they're interrelated because while we in pharma as a manufacturer have that focus of health literacy, we don't always have the trust of that population, nor do we have the awareness that these resources even exist. And I will say we have tremendous resources available for people, but they probably don't know they exist. So with that, I think probably the key theme here that I'm thinking about recently and probably uh, need to accelerate even further is partnership. So first of all, I think we have to meet patients where they are. Um, I think the old ways of the past of pharma trying to drive them into where we want them to go isn't always working because Again, when I've spoken to patients, they're not coming necessarily to pharma to look for that information. They're going to advocacy organizations or they're going to peers, they're going to social media. So how do we meet them where they are? Form, I think, meaningful partnerships to say, we have this great information, but we need to partner maybe with an advocacy organization or figure out in the local community, how do we get the 
people this information that exists to help with that overall health literacy. So I think we can't do it in silos. That's probably been a giant mistake that we've made. And I think some of it was because we were afraid, you know, just given that we are in that highly regulated environment. But I think now there's more appetite and more availability to partner. And that's what we have to do to truly impact and increase the health literacy. Because I think the resources probably exist. It's just we have to get them to the people. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think that definitely echoes some of the, the points you've made about, um, for example, from patient support perspective, we know that only a small percentage of the people who are eligible for support actually get access to it. Yep. And Jeff, I'll, I'll ask you to comment on that one. Yeah, I guess all I wanted to say really about health literacy, Sharon, was that I agree with everything that's been said so far. And there's not much I can add to it apart from, I think for us, health literacy is going to be really high on the agenda for the Cancer Insights paddle next year and the year after and the year after. And I think our, for the Oncology BU in Pfizer UK, our approach and our strategy is going to be guided by what the patients tell us we should be doing. So to, to kind of go back to, to where we started from with some of these discussions, we aren't going to be going to the patient panel and saying this is what we're going to be doing about health literacy. We're going to be asking them to guide our thinking moving forward. Absolutely. Can I just jump in there, Sharon? You know, um, this also takes us to addressing the structural issues that are going on regionally and globally in healthcare, but then also economically. So we can't just focus on the health literacy without focusing on literacy, like Rajit said, but we also know that we can't just focus on equity without focusing on health equity, that everything goes hand in hand. So we have to understand the parameters that the people that we're working with, that they live in, the community involvement is a, it's an investment, right? It's not performative. It's not, I'll show up at a fair. I will work with one or two patients. It's a long-term investment saying, I care about where your food comes from. I, clear, I care about, you know, whether you live in a food desert. I, I care about climate change. I care about the education that you're receiving. And, and I care about your health as well. And when the patients are involved in improving their own health literacy and the industry does that as well, we also then have a greater level of shared decision-making. I saw someone ask a question about how do we better inform the patients if they're approaching with a bias. Shared decision-making only happens when every party feels reciprocal education, that there's co-learning going on. And a lot of patients care partners and family members don't feel that they're involved in that, not just when the product reaches the market, but they don't feel involved throughout. So when we say we care about investing in your education, we care about you being able to make actionable decisions about your health. And that is something that we, we can't shove it down anyone's throat, right? By saying we're doing something culturally competent. We have to be culturally humble about how we approach it with them, but that takes time. Absolutely. Yeah, long-term so, investment. So well said. Um, and as you're talking about investment, um, one of the things that strikes me is that there's also a really big investment from, from your end, from the people, the patient experts. And so I'm wondering if you can share some advice to the folks here uh, on the pharma side as to how we can help you. How might we support you knowing that this co-creation and partnership is also a lot on you? Okay, I guess that's for me. <laughs> so we can start um, with you, Min. Yeah. I I I love this question um, because it, we really have to remember that patients are already approaching with a burden. And if you're asking for involvement, you're asking for participation, we don't want to exacerbate that. We want to make sure that mental health services are um, partnered with the ambassadors, the engagers that are working with you. I really would stress that. We want to make sure that the people that we're working with are able to make great decisions and, and feel well about themselves. And I also would say that we don't know what we don't know, right? So we have to continue to ask these questions of all different sorts of patients, all different sorts of backgrounds. If we don't see them at the table, we need to make sure we bring them in. We need to make sure that we don't create any gaps in the patient industry in itself. We have to bring all of those individuals um, into the, the forefront. Absolutely. When I, when I may add something, I would also say don't just involve patient organization, they do a great job, but there are a lot of bloggers 
influencers, Instagrammers outside. And they are really, really good informed people. And they have the community. Uh, I also saw that in, in, the, in the chat going on, what's the impact of us bloggers? Hey, we have a big community in our back, so we can share a voice and we can be very loud when we active our community, activate our communities. And I think this is important. And uh, on the other hand, my advice would be keep it as an open, transparent dialogue. Be open for ideas, innovation, and also provide um, the transparency and information about your work. Give us also a look behind your scenes because this is also important. Patients want to know how you work. So don't, don't just say to me, hey, it's the compliance manager. This is what I heard so much in the last years. And, but sometimes, yes, it is compliance and it's important. But give them the why. Don't say, this is what happens. That's it. Give them the why, the reasons. This is also an important point. Because uh, to activate those bloggers, by the way, is also to, 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 be, to inform them properly. Give them the information they need also to, to share the information. And you can count on them. And this is the influence what we have to the communities. And I would say also, Monique, you have a lot of followers and community members in your community. I have it in mine. And when we share something, we have that influence. Or let me say it in that way, we have that voice. And we can create opinion. We can help people to find an opinion while because we give them the right resources, links, or also facts about that. And I think this is what we have to share. Absolutely. So in the, in the few minutes we have left, thank you so much for that. Um, some really important key themes have come up in this discussion around partnership, ongoing partnership, the idea of co-creation, not making assumptions about what someone might need and want and taking that extra step to invest in understanding the differences and being there in the community and making sure that we've got people who reflect the people, the patients that we're, that we're working with. So in the three minutes we have left, I'll ask all of you to just share one piece of advice that you have for the folks who are with us at the webinar today. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, so my advice uh, would be, um, if you're gonna go down the same path that I've been, grow a very thick skin, become very persistent, don't take no for an answer, uh, have a clear vision, and keep going for it. Fantastic, I love that. Uh, Desiree? I love that, Jeff. Um, mine would be to just simply get started, to dip your toe in the water and start talking to patients. It will be uncomfortable at first because it's new, but you have to get started. And then once you start, I think you'll see the benefits right away. And I don't think you'll stop after that. So get started. I love that. Monique, anything you'd like to add? I would say be honest. Um, we can't just show up to the party and act like we've had we've been here and we had a great time. It hasn't always been good. So I think we need to have a sense of acknowledgement and honesty about where the issues have been and why it's really important to engage patients early and often. And um, that's just a really great place to start. Fantastic. Birgit, anything you want to add? I would say keep in the dialogue. Inform, empower, and educate. Inform, empower, educate, be honest, stay in the game, grow a thick skin, all great advice. I'll turn it over to Hensley in case you want to say a few words before we close. You know, the, the one thing that I, um, I loved that Monique said was, you know, and you said it about community, community is not performative, but I think patient centricity is not performative. And, and I think one of the things that, that we have occasionally and maybe more than occasionally been guilty of is um, talking about patient centricity as a performative act to like, hey, aren't we great? Instead of really doing it. Um, and so I think that was a, I, I love that phrase, Monique. I'm gonna hopefully with your permission borrow that. And I think we're I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah from Reuters for like the last sort of uh, closing words from our, from our host. And just to say thank you so much uh, for all our panelists, for all of your time, your wonderful uh, stories and sharing your very uh, open and honest feedback. And thank you for all of you who joined us in the webinar and for your excellent questions. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you to everyone who joined us today and also for contributing in the chat. Um, I'm really excited to tell you um, about 
a um, event that we have coming up fairly soon. Um, you should be able to see it um, here um, on the screen. Um, if it has not, clearly Zoom has not been our best friend today. So I apologise for any of the issues that there might have been. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers coming up in Philadelphia in person. It's very exciting and that will be happening in March. Um, it would be fantastic to see more of you there. We've got a number of patient speakers we're working with to lead many of these critical conversations in addition to the keynote speakers um, that you'll see um, on the screen now. Um, but I see we're at um, time, so please do feel free to reach out to us with any questions you may have and also um, to check out the event and you'll be receiving information with the recording um, of this webinar either at the end of this week or early next week so thank you so much for your time and we will see you again shortly thanks everyone thanks so much thank again to the panelists have a great day